Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. The day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judea. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that commandment. Though I love them as a husband loves his wife, says the Lord. But this is a new commandment I will make with the people of Israel. After these days, says the Lord, I will put my instructions deep within the, them, and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people, and they will not need to teach their neighbors, or the, will they need to teach their relatives, saying, You should know the Lord. For everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already, says the Lord. And I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Wimborne Alliance Church family. Now, welcome as well. If you've just found us online, either through our website or maybe you've subscribed to our YouTube channel and you got a notification or you follow us on our Facebook page. Thank you for joining us today. We appreciate that. Our prayer is that you would be encouraged and drawn closer to Jesus as you watch this video. We're continuing on in our journey through the book of Hebrews. And so I would invite you to take your Bible or open your device and turn to Hebrews chapter 8. Um, the Bible is God's word to us. He's speaking to us through, through these words. And so it's always a good idea to pause and ask his help as we study his word. And so I invite you to pray with me. O oh Lord, in your mercy and kindness, would you open your word to us and open us to your word. Amen. We're going to read our text today, our text this morning, um, in Hebrews chapter 8. And I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation. Hebrews chapter 8, the writer says, Here is the main point. We have a high priest who sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. And there he ministers in the heavenly tabernacle, the true place of worship that was built by the Lord and not by human hands. And since Every high priest is required to offer gifts and sacrifices. Our high priest must make an offering too. If he were here on earth, he would not even be a priest since there are already priests who offer the gifts required by the law. They serve in a system of worship that is only a copy, a shadow of the real one in heaven. For when Moses was getting ready to build the tabernacle, God gave him this warning. Make sure that you make everything according to the pattern that I've given you here on the mountain. But now Jesus, our high priest, has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood. For he is the one, and this is where we're going to focus on today, he is the one who mediates for us a far better covenant with God based on better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need for a second covenant to replace it. But when God found fault with the people, he said, and now the writer of Hebrews quotes the prophet Jeremiah, the day is coming says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. They did not remain faithful to my covenant, and so I turned my back on them, says the Lord. This is the new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, I will be their God, and they will be my people. And they will not need to teach their neighbors, and they will not need to teach their relatives, saying, you should know the Lord. For everyone, from the least to the greatest, will know me already. 
and I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. When God speaks of a new covenant, it means he has made the first one obsolete. It is now out of date and will soon disappear. This is God's word. What a wonderful portion of scripture we have before us today. It's another fairly thick passage. It's going to require some focus and some disciplined thought to work through. It's good for us to keep in mind that Hebrews was written by a pastor to his Jewish friends, his Jewish Christian friends. This was about 30 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he wrote them this letter, this sermon, really, to encourage them, to warn them, to keep the faith in face of some opposition and persecution. And in this part of the book, it's real easy to get lost in details and not be able to fit the different parts of the writer's whole argument together with his purpose of encouraging his readers to keep the faith. And so as we study this chapter together today, we're just going to pick up on one important truth about Jesus that's going to help us understand several other important principles of the, of, of the faith and what that means in the weeks to come. So it's important to remember that the purpose of this book of Hebrews, that everything relates to and supports, is to warn and encourage Christians to keep the faith, to persevere in the faith. And so what do we make of this chapter? The, ch the writer induces, introduces several new things. He talks about the tabernacle, both the earthly tabernacle and the heavenly tabernacle. He talks about true worship. He talks about the old covenant and the new covenant. And he quotes extensively from the prophet Jeremiah. What's his main point? What do we need to understand from these 13 verses that's going to encourage us to keep the faith today? Well, he begins chapter 8 with the affirmation of the main point of his call to persevere. The main point of what he's saying in all of the book is that we have a high priest who sat down in the place of honor beside the throne of the majestic God in heaven. This is what it's about. And then he brings up what Jesus, our high priest, is doing there. He says there he ministers in the heavenly tabernacle. A few verses later he says, Jesus, our high priest, has been given a ministry. And so we ask, what is his ministry? What is his service now? Is he just sitting on the throne, just waiting and passing the time? Is he just waiting until the fullness of time when he returns to earth as a conquering king? No, not, not at all. The writer of Hebrews points to Jesus' current ministry in heaven as reason for us to confidently persevere in the faith. Jesus' ministry is now, verse 6, to mediate for us a far better covenant with God based on better promises. To mediate for us a far better covenant. Clearly, we understand that Jesus' work of atonement is completed. His work on the cross is completed. But his work or his ministry of advocating or mediating is ongoing. That's what he's doing now. And so the next couple of chapters explore in depth things like the new covenant and better promises and true worship and other things. So we're not going to explore those today. There's so much for us to learn and appreciate in just one word that's used three times in Hebrews that describes what Jesus is doing now in heaven. And that word, if you haven't guessed it already, is mediator. Jesus is our mediator. He is the one who mediates for us a far better covenant with God based on better promises. And so we have to ask, what is a mediator? What is mediation? 
And so I looked it up in my dictionary and mediation is defined as to work with both sides in a dispute in an attempt to help them reach an agreement or it's to achieve a solution, a settlement or agreement by working with both sides in a dispute. And similarly, my dictionary describes and defines a mediator as one who confers with both sides in a dispute in a way as to help them reach an agreement. And so we have a mediator, works with both sides to help them reach an agreement. And I suspect that when we think of a mediator, we think of one that just goes between two parties that are in dispute. Maybe we think of a negotiator, maybe in a, in a police setting you know, where there's a, a hostage situation and, and he's negotiating or mediating, trying to find a solution to the dispute or to the problem. Sometimes we might think of, of a parent trying to mediate between two siblings that are quarreling and have a dispute. Maybe we think of an impartial third party perhaps in a business setting, or something that has been brought in to assist in resolving conflict through the use of specialized communication and negotiation techniques. Jesus is our mediator. 1 Timothy 2.5 reads, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. And when you hear that, what's your response? What picture comes to your mind? What words come to your mind? Before I spent time in this particular text and with this word, my impression was that Jesus was just working for me. He was representing my interests to God, my advocate, my intercessor. He's just working for me. And as I further considered the word mediator and its popular meaning, my stomach actually sank. Is he a negotiator? Am I in a in a negotiation with God? Is Jesus an impartial third party that's been assigned to my case? I thought, if Jesus is my mediator, what kind of swing does he have? What kind of authority does he have? Why should the Father listen to him? Why should I listen to him? If he's just a go-between, if he's just trying to facilitate a dispute between God and I. Because if there is a dispute, a disagreement, a problem between God and I, there's no question that I'm going to come out on the short end of the stick because God doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't make concessions. He doesn't change his mind. His word, his oath, his promises, his purposes are unchanging. So clearly, Jesus has to be a better, has to be better than a go-between. He has to be better than an impartial third party trying to settle a dispute between God and mankind. The writer of Timothy, the writer of Hebrew, Hebrews, have to have something else in mind. And so, I dug a little deeper. I discovered that the word mediator is used two ways, two different ways in the New Testament. One is the way that I've described here as a, as a go-between to help two parties resolve a dispute. The other actually fits what Jesus is doing now in heaven. The other way in which mediator is used is the one who acts as a guarantee. The one who acts as a guarantee so as to secure something which otherwise would not be obtained. And this kind of mediator has his own skin in the game, so to speak. This kind of mediator is not an impartial third party. This kind of mediator is not frantically going in between two parties trying to negotiate a deal negotiating terms and to get conditions, trying to get each party to compromise their way to something they can both live with. Not at all. This is what the writer of Hebrews was talking about in, he in Hebrews 7.22. There's a different word, but it means the same thing as what he means by mediator. Hebrews 7.22 says, Jesus is the guarantor of a better covenant. He guarantees the better covenant. Guaran Jesus guarantees the covenant that he is mediating. As we think about this, we need to mention something that is obvious, but sometimes we forget. The dispute between God and man since the Garden of Eden 
when Adam and Eve disobeyed God and sin entered the world, is that a holy God and a sinful man cannot have a love relationship. There's no negotiation here. There's no compromise. There's no dealing. There's no, you give a little and I'll give a little and we can both walk away happy. That's not going to happen here. This dispute, this breach in relationship reaches deep into the nature and character of a holy God and it touches, and it is the desperate need of sinful mankind who is helpless to bridge this gap. God cannot have a love relationship with someone who is stained by sin. He cannot do that and be who he is. And this is the problem. This is the dispute or situation. But there is a covenant. There is a promise. And we'll go farther into this when we study uh, through the next chapters. But suffice it to say now that God desires this love relationship with sinful mankind. He wants the people he's created to love him, to trust him, to serve him. But sin has to be dealt with. God has promised to mercifully and graciously receive those into his presence who are righteous. I mean, those whose sin has been dealt with. God, God has made a covenant with man. And this covenant is not a deal that's been negotiated between two equal parties. Uh, no, the sense of covenant here is more like a testament, like a last will and testament. It's final and unalterable. When somebody writes a will and then passes away, the will can't be negotiated with the one that wrote it. It's final and unalterable. So there's two sides. God has promised merciful and gracious access to himself without condemnation. He, he's promised a love relationship. Mankind has to figure out what to do with sin, how to deal with sin, how to be acceptable to God, how to be righteous. And the terms of the problem, like we've said, are fixed. They're not negotiable. Or God would have to cease to be holy. He would have to change who he is. Mankind here is pretty much out of luck because there's no way we can make ourselves righteous and acceptable to God. I mean, we can try. We can try to be good, we can live a good life, and we can be nice, but the standard for righteousness is way beyond our reach. We have to be as righteous as God to have a love relationship with him. And so we're hooked, we're out of luck. Nope, not a, it's a no-go situation. We need someone with skin in the game. We need someone who can guarantee our righteousness and at the same time, guarantee our acceptability to God. We need a different kind of mediator. We need one, we need someone who lives in both camps. Someone who's got the power and authority of God to speak on his behalf, to guarantee forgiveness and acceptance. And we need someone who's walked in our shoes as a human being, able to identify with our weakness, to deal with our sin problem completely and declare us acceptable to God. We need a guarantor. We need a guarantee. Someone to guarantee this covenant. Jesus guarantees to God that those who are in him, those that he's bringing, are acceptable. And Jesus guarantees to mankind that God will fulfill his covenant of forgiveness. And God will keep his word. Jesus is this different kind of mediator. He guarantees that both parties, God and man, will keep their promises and keep their word. How does Jesus do that? Why does it matter? Jesus guarantees to God, let's think about this for a moment. Jesus guarantees to God that those who are in him, those who are in Jesus, who trust him, Jesus guaranteed to God that those who trust him and are in him are acceptable. So he says to God, I'm not going to bring you anyone who isn't acceptable to you. And so he guarantees our part, our responsibility to be acceptable to God. To be acceptable to God means that we're holy, we're without sin, we're able to stand in his presence. And there's no way we can do this on our own merit because if we pay the price for our sin, we die. So 
We need someone to pay the price for us. Not only that, not only do we have to deal with God's wrath being satisfied against our sin, we need righteousness. And we need to be able to be in the presence of God without fear of judgment or condemnation. We need to be holy. Jesus declares us righteous, justifies us, on the merit of his sacrifice. It is as if Jesus clothes us in new garments, his garments, pure white and holy, his righteousness. We are justified by the justifier, by the one who guarantees our acceptance to the Most High God. No longer do we have to try and prove ourselves. No longer do we have to wonder if God will accept us. No longer do we fear condemnation. No longer do we lower our, our eyes in shame or withdraw, overcome with guilt, regret, and failure. To understand that Jesus guarantees that we are acceptable to God and, and he guarantees our commitment to him and trusting him, this is life-giving and freeing and enabling. To know that Jesus right now is advocating for us, for me. As I bring my failures, sin, shame, and pockets of disbelief to him, Jesus takes me to the throne of grace and says, this one is mine. I've paid for his sin. I've given him my righteousness. And so Mark has unrestricted access to you, Father. Mark has unrestricted access to everything that I've purchased with my blood. So, Father, he's acceptable to you. Extend your mercy to him. Give Mark grace to help him in his time of need. Receive Mark. Bless Mark. Enable Mark to receive all your promises. This is what he says for me. Because Jesus has paid the price of sinfulness for mankind once and for all with his own death, and he's given his word that whoever trusts him to save them will be saved indeed. And he, and, and he guarantees to God, to his Father, that whoever is saved, whoever believes in his name, is acceptable, is righteous, has access to the throne of grace. We can have confidence in Jesus' name. Not only that, Jesus guarantees to men that God will fulfill his covenant of righteousness. This is the other part of the, of the covenant. Jesus guarantees to me that God will fulfill his covenant, that God's going to keep his word. How does Jesus guarantee that God is going to keep his word? What does God say? God says, I'm going to put my laws in your minds and I'm going to write them on your hearts and I'm going to forgive their wickedness and I'm never again going to remember their sin. This is the new covenant. So when Jesus gives the Holy Spirit to those who trust him to save them, he ensures that everyone who belongs to him will know him. He'll be able to hear his voice and have his hope. We experience hope through the Holy Spirit. We have fellowship in the divine presence, eternal fellowship in the divine presence. This is our hope. When Jesus died on the cross and paid the penalty for our sin, he satisfied the wrath of God against sin once and for all. And, now, and God is now justified in forgiving because the debt's been paid. God is now justified in forgiving sin. He's giving up the right to hurt us for the hurt that we caused him. This is forgiveness. Because Jesus took that hurt, that pain, that price in our place. So God can forgive our sins and remember them no more and receive us with confident mercy and generous grace, remaining true to who he is as God. To know that right now, to know that Jesus is guaranteeing that God's going to keep his promises, that's wonderful. Jesus says to me in his word, through his spirit, he says, I forgive you. I will cleanse you. I will give you the power from on high for holy living. I will form my character in you. I, I accept you. Jesus guarantees that God will accept me. 
He will keep his promise. I can have confidence that no matter what I've done, what I'm going through, how badly I've failed or how proud I've been, that when I humble myself and confess my sin and repent of it, that God will forgive me. Jesus guarantees that. Not only forgive me, but cleanse me. And not only cleanse me, but bring healing, freedom, and deliverance from what? Anything that would hold me back from truly worshiping and knowing him. You know, this Jesus, this Jesus is a different kind of mediator. He's got skin in the game. He himself is the guarantee of the covenant. He's the one I need, and that you need today. We can confidently proclaim that we're no longer a slave to fear. We are a child of God. We can confidently sing, this is an amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You laid down your life, that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all you've done for me. Jesus is a wonderful mediator. He's our guarantee that we're acceptable to God. And he's our guarantee that God will keep his word to us. Our prayer today is that you're encouraged. Our hope is that you think more highly of Jesus, that he has become more beautiful, more precious, and more wonderful to you. If you want to know more about this Jesus, or perhaps you're at a point in your life where you're at your wit's end and don't know what to do, drop us a note here at Wimborne Alliance at Hotmail.com, and we would love to connect with you and point you towards Jesus. And so, as always, thank you for joining us. Thank you for watching. And until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.